in the second half, I want to talk a little bit about what I mentioned at the at the outset, the uh, questions of uh, socialist participation in government, colonialism, immigration, women's suffrage, and militarism and war. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between, between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Mike Tabor has edited and prepared a number of books related to the history of revolutionary and working class movements, from collections of documents of the Communist International under Lenin to works by uh, James P. Cannon, Leon Trotsky, Malcolm X, Che Guerra, Fidel Castro, Maurice Bishop, and Nelson Mandela. His books, his new book, Under the Socialist Banner, is a collection of the resolutions of the Second International from 1889 to 1912. Mike, uh, welcome to the Diet Soap Podcast. Great. Thanks. It's nice to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, you've you've created a, or you're preparing a follow-up book to this book um, uh, that's going to be published hopefully by Haymarket next year. Um, this this one featured resolutions of the Second International's Congresses. This next one will include excerpts from oral debates uh, at these Congresses on five topics of contemporary interest, socialist participation in government, um, colonialism, immigration, women's suffrage, and militarism and war. Why did you choose those particular topics? And, and also just more broadly, why do you think that studying the Second International is necessary today? Um, well, just to, um, to step back on it, I think virtually all socialists today are direct descendants of the Second International of 1889 to 1914. Mm -hmm. um, but relatively few know, really know much about it, or for that matter, are particularly interested in studying it. Um, and I, I know this because this, um, this, this is how I was. Um, when I first came to the socialist movement, I had absolutely no interest in uh, studying the Second International. After all, this was the um, uh, the, the movement that uh, supported World War One in 1914, betrayed the working class, it uh, opposed a number of revolutionary struggles after um, after 1917. Uh, for the last, oh, really, for you know, really up until the present day for the last century, um, it's uh, taken a position, of, you know, in opposition to uh, the colonial revolution, to struggles against imperialist domination and so forth. I actually came to the Second International um, through the Third International, that's the Communist International. Um, since 1983, I've worked on a project um, to help publish the works of the you know, of the uh, Communist International, the common turn under Lenin, uh, to, to basically to present this movement in its own words. And often I'd come across references to Second International Resolutions or documents, um, and I, I would just have to look them up. And I, so originally I, the idea for the first, for the, uh, under the socialist banner, the collection of resolutions was simply uh, to put, put together for the first time ever in English, all the resolutions of the uh, uh, Second International from 1889 to 1912. Uh -huh. uh, and I thought this would be a, a useful service. But as I started to compile the, the material, it began, I, it, um, it, um, there was a certain revelation about the, um, it just struck me about the, you know, the, um, you know, the revolutionary Marxist nature of many of the resolutions, as well as I began to understand what I've come to call the conflicted legacy, um, you know, of, of the international. Um, and, um, you know, and, and this is something that um, um, it's, 
valuable for socialists today for a number of reasons. One, you know, one is because a lot of the subjects, for example, in the the follow up book that I'm I'm um, that I've prepared on some of some of these debates, a lot of the, these these are subjects that are still current. Um, the question of war, the question of women's rights, the question of immigration, and colonialism, and imperialism. Um, uh, socialist tactics and the fight for uh, how to win socialist power. Um, th these are uh, subjects that are very much on the, um, you know, on the subjects of debate uh, and discussion in the movement. And also just to be, to, to know, to understand what the second international is. Um, not that, uh, uh, that it, it that, we should be trying to simply recreate this movement, but we need to understand the, the strengths, the weaknesses, the contradictions. Um, it's part of our legacy. Um, and, you know, without, uh, if, you, if you don't, uh, if, you, if you can't grasp your own legacy, it's hard to, um, to deal with the problems and challenges that we're gonna be having in the next, uh, in the next number of years. So I'm going to ask you kind of a um, simple-minded and, and newbie kind of question, but how many internationals have there been? There's been the first, the second, the third, the fourth, with, which was Trotskyism. Has there been a fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth? How many have there been? Well, the uh, Marx and Engels um, uh, really helped organize the what's called the first international. It wasn't known that at the time. It was the International yeah. Working Men's Association. It was organized in 1864. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, at, at the time, the working class movement was in a sort of a very um, early stage in most countries. And there were, no, you know, outside of maybe one or two places, there were no real working class parties. Um, for the, There really weren't a lot of mass uh, trade unions either. It was a lot of... Uh, you know, all kinds of different organizations, cooperatives and and other things. And um, it was a, an attempt by Marx and Engels primarily to help uh, begin to pull together uh, this into a world movement. And, uh, you know, it, it accomplished, you know, quite a bit and left an, an, an important legacy. But it, it given the state of the working class movement at the time, it by the mid 18s, early to mid 1870s, it um, it had sort of run run its course. When did the first international start? The... Uh, in 1864. Okay. Uh, in the middle of the American Civil War, as a matter of fact, the uh, the opening meeting in London um, had a uh, an American flag in the uh, in the background. At that time, the the United States and the, the American it was in the you know was the fight against uh, slavery, and it was uh, one of the few uh, republics in the world, and it, it represented a lot of people as it represented pro, you know progress in the world. A lot of uh, um, you know working people and others identified with it, but uh, it, you know it's an interesting chapter. So. Uh, and then they just to ask a question about the first international a bit more. So the so 1864, that's a, a bit after um, 1848, the revolutionary struggles um, in the middle of the uh, 19th century. Um, how did Marx and Engels and the rest of the um, first international conceive of their struggles as in relationship to that revolutionary struggle that had happened in 1848? Um were they taking a step beyond that, or how did they think about the, their their revolu revolutionary politics then? Well, I, they um, they still they still stood on the um, the basic uh, programmatic um, uh, uh, platform that they had put forward in the Communist Manifesto in uh, mm. 1847, Um uh, the after in the years after uh, following the 1848 uh, revolution, you know, revolution throughout, you know, which you know, throughout Europe, um, there was a, a, a sort of a, a reaction to it, and the the movement had to take a step backwards. So when uh, Marx and Engels uh, began to, they saw an opportunity when the first international, when the International Workingmen's Association was founded. Uh, to 
begin to link up with the, um, you know, with the with the movement that and with the platform that they had uh, laid out, and and to bring it to a much broader audience. Um, and they they work with a number of, uh, especially uh, British trade union uh, unions. They were it was organized, and you know there were a number of uh, supporters in, throughout in France, Switzerland, many other many other countries in Europe. Um, so it was an opportunity to expand the movement and bring in whole new layers of the uh, of the working class, which was then in the process of uh, growing and developing throughout uh, throughout Europe and North America. In particular, but uh, just I'm I'm not a historian, so to correct me if I'm wrong here. But my understanding is like 1848 was was put a revolution that was put down not only for uh, socialists but also for you know bourgeois revolutionaries that they that it, there was the struggle for republicanism and national independence and and uh, to to break with monarchies and uh, autocracies was was defeated. In 1848, to a large degree. Um, so I'm just wondering if uh, how linked up the uh, first international was with bourgeois revolutionaries that were still struggling after the defeat of 1848. Um, well, well, the um, you know you, you're right about the the 1848 the, the revolutions of 1848 49. Um, um, much of it was was directed against the uh, the fact that almost all countries in um, in the world, uh, you know, were either monarchies, the, uh, the feudal remnants were abounded. Um, there were uh, uh, the um, at, at the time during the time Marx and Engels viewed themselves and viewed the the uh, the, the early communist movement as sort of a left wing of the democratic revolution. Mm-hmm. Uh, what happened was the the 1848 uh, revolution. One of the things that it did, particular, you know, in particularly in Britain and in France, in Britain to uh, to some extent, was it began to waken the the working class movement. And this, a lot of the um, uh, the these the bourgeois republicans, the people who uh, were totally scared off by this and um, actually retreated from it. Uh, they they saw that this this what they viewed as this monster this working this working class de- demanding its rights uh, and this is not what they wanted to see they wanted a, a you know a bourgeois republic where their privileges would be protected and that they would be in charge and not some feudal you know uh, feudal nobility or monarchy. Um, mm-hmm. So they they retreated from the movement. So, but that by the time the first international was founded, most of these um, uh, uh, bourgeois Repu- uh, you know, Republican forces didn't want anything to do with uh, with the uh, the working class movement. Okay, yeah. So, and and that informed the self conception of the first international as well. Mm-hmm. Uh huh. Um, so. The, the how did it come to be that there was in this it became necessary to form a second international? What happened to the first international and its efforts to cause it to be dissolved? And I mean, I I kind of know a little bit. It had to do with anarchism, but um, I, I'll let you explain how how did that come to be? Well, it was actually mainly um, in 1871 in France. The uh, you had the the Paris Commune, um, which you know in the context of it, it took place in the midst of the uh, of a war between France and Prussia, um, where Prussia was you know had defeated France and was, uh, but anyway, it, it um, what happened was the working class of Paris basically seized power and held power for several months. It was the first example in history of the working class actually taking political power. Um, and the, uh, the, the, this example terrified the ruling powers of, of really the entire world. And, uh, for, uh, 
you know, for example, the, when when the Paris Commune was defeated, there was a you know, really a bloodbath as the uh, uh, the, the surrendering uh, uh, thousands of Parisian workers were just put against the wall and shot. You mm-hmm. know, part of the uh, and there was this massive camp campaign of hysteria that was waged through the media, through the world media, and elsewhere. Um, about the about these these terrible communards who were trying to overthrow civilization and the church and the family and you know all the other you know, all this other stuff, uh, and there was all kinds of things about how the first international was in charge was behind the whole thing, and so there was a an international campaign against the first international, and in the, in that context, it the 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 base of the international was not. Um, large enough to withstand that. And there were, as you, you, you mentioned the divisions within it with anarchism and, you know, and other, other currents. And it was, um, uh, it, it, uh, there was no alternative, but to basically to, to let it pass um, mm. after the scene. But then in the, you know, in between the middle 1870s and the late 1880s, there was a massive, you know, a real growth of the working class movement throughout Europe and North America. And there was, you know, a, you know, a, some massive, you know, parties, unions and others began to be formed. And there was um, a, a, the, the opportunity arose to, uh, to, to reestablish the international it, you know, we call it the Second International, but it actually didn't, it never actually had a formal name. Um, people refer to it as the Second International because sort of as a, as a way of um, recalling the work of the First International and mm-hmm. seeing, uh, seeing its, its continuity with that. And in fact, a lot of the, um, the, the early leaders of the Second International were the same people who had helped lead the First International. Um, so there were there was and a lot of the a lot of the resolutions and other things dealt with a lot of the same themes that the, the first international had had dealt. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, you you write in your book that the second international at its inception was heterogeneous, uh, uh, and uh, you know how 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 many ten, you know tendencies were included at the outset within the second international, how, how diverse were the perspectives on socialism at the beginning? Well, I would say in, in terms of the question of heterogeneity, there, there's mm-hmm. really three levels of heterogeneity. One was in, um, the condition of the various countries. Um, you know, this is, you know, we look at the, at the world today, there's, there's many, you know, commonalities in, um, you know, between most countries uh, and their economies on, and, uh, and many other questions. But at the time, that wasn't the case. You had, you had some developed capitalist countries with uh, developed, in, you know, with industry growing. You had countries that were overwhelmingly agricultural with little industry. You had some countries with colonial empires, um, you know, others, you know, others not and so forth. Um, you had different types of political conditions in the country, from monarchies to uh, countries with uh, some some degree of, of democratic rights uh, um, and so forth. You also had, uh, sec- secondly, you had different levels of working class organization. Um, in 1889, when the Second International was founded, there was really one, only one what you could call mass working class party, which was the social democratic party in Germany. And you had, had smaller parties in, in other countries. You had different degrees of trade union organization. And, you know, all throughout Europe, they were growing, but, um, you know, in, in different, different degrees. Now, the third thing that I think you're uh, referring to specifically on the, the political diversity in it. Mm-hmm. Uh, now you had, um, I mean, there were different uh, wings of the, you know, the working class movement. Uh, you know, there was still the legacy of anarchism, you know, which mm-hmm. particularly in Southern Europe was, was quite strong. It was one of the things that sort of helped contribute to the demise of the first international. Um, but you also had different, in, in France, for example, you had, there were, 
uh, two main working class parties, one that was um, uh, the, sort of the revolutionary Marxist wing. Um, and you had a second wing, which was, uh, you know, a, a, a reformist one, which um, was called uh, uh, the, the, the term that was used then was the possibilists. Be, you know, the, the reason for that was because their, their goal was to, to, uh, to, to fight for reforms that it considered possible uh, you know, within, you know, capitalist society. So they were the capitalists. Um, uh, you had uh, one of the interesting points that um, when the Second International was, uh, 1889, when it was founded, there were actually two, two separate Congresses. Um, there was the Marxist Congress, and uh, actually both of them in the same, both of them were, the same dates and at the same city in Paris. Uh, and then, so you had the Revolutionary Marxist Congress and then you had the uh, the Reformist Possibilist Congress also. Mm -hmm. uh, so. What would be considered possible then? Um, and, you know, was, a, was it a difference between a, some sort of minimal program and a maximal program or was it, or even some reforms? thought to be beyond the bounds of what was possible by the possibilist or what, what were the, what was the limit there? Well, well, it, it's, uh, you know, rather than uh, th their idea was, you know, rather than focusing on, I mean, the, the, re the, the revolutionary Marxist, the, the Marxist Wayne, you know, posed the need that, um, that, that, what, that, what, well, certainly you, you fight for, you know, all you, you accept and you fight for all reforms that benefit the working class and, and they, you know, the people in general, but at the same time, you, 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 they, they understood that um, the condition, the, the general condition of the working class could, could only be, um, uh, changed uh, fundamentally by changing the social order, where they uh, you replace the rule of the capitalist by a uh, the rule of the rule of the working class. That was the perspective of the you know going back to the uh, the Communist Manifesto, and that was actually that of the First International. Um, so it. Um, but whereas some of the, uh, the the possibilist forces, the you know the, the reformists. Um, they wanted to focus almost exclusively simply on the fight and not, not to talk about so much about the, you know, these, these, this other stuff, but mm -hmm. to focus in on, on simply the, uh, the more minimal, uh, things of what it felt was possible, which is, um, which is actually sort of self-defeating because almost every major uh, reform that's ever done has come about through, um, you know, uh, the fight for more fundamental structural and social change, and then reforms are granted as a way of um, when, when it's felt that that's necessary. Um, I'm reminded of uh, the, the crisis in Marxism that occurred, I think, a little further down the road from where we're at right now in our, in our history, but it, it was in the late 19th century. Um, there was a feeling that there was a need to revise Marx's um, tenets and theories. Uh, Bernstein attempted to to revise Marx's ideas um, in the wake of the a boom after the the Long Depression. I think was part of it. They, they was, he argued that it was not necessary to to actually install a proletariat power, but rather that through the gradual expansion of capitalist forces that socialism would be. Yeah, kind of evolve into place. Um, and there was a debate within the international and second international, I believe, uh, which he lost. Uh, but I've, I've heard, I've, I've seen, I've read that it argued that um, while Bernstein lost the theoretical debate, the practical uh, political decisions of the party uh, or of the international after that were more in line with Bernstein's perspective than with the more revolutionary Kautsky. Um, is that true? Does, was a, did the possibilist uh, faction have 
you know, m- make a lot of progress in controlling the terms of second international debates or setting the, the horizon in, in the inter- in second international? Um, well, it's, uh, you know, even though the, uh, there were, you know, possibilist reformist forces, with, you know, within the second international, you know, really, you know, from the, from the beginning, uh, I mean, after, uh, okay, at the, I mean, one thing was uh, Frederick Engels, Marx's, uh, the, the, you know, uh, mm-hmm. close collaborator, was very much involved in helping to organize the founding Congress of the Second International and uh, collaborated with the organizers of it and, and so forth. And he, w- he helped um, uh, make sure that the, the, uh, the resolutions of the, that, that were adopted were in line with, um, you know, with the the revolutionary perspective that he and Marx had, had fought for. And it really for the, you know, even though there were these reformist forces in the international, uh, really for the first, um, you know, close to a decade, uh, the, the, the Marxist perspective of the, that at least they were, formally in its resolutions were not challenged. And as you say, it was Bernstein, it was Edward Bernstein who, who, who himself had been a, a, you know, a collaborator of Marx and Engels and one of the, the leaders of the German social democratic party. You know, he, you know, he developed uh, around 1890, after 1897, um, really up through 1897, 98, 99, a, um, you know, what he called it evolutionary, so, you know, uh, evolutionary socialism that, uh, first of all, capitalism had uh, overcome many of the contradictions that Marx and Engels had had pointed to, that it was able to to resolve some of them, that it was possible to um, uh, to uh, uh, get, you know, sand down its rough edges, make um, um you know, make gains that it wasn't necessary to talk so much about, you know, the, the, the final goal, the, you know, the, the need for revolution and so forth. And I think they, that they, what, how we expressed it was the, um, um, well, the, how, the, at the movement itself is, is everything. The final, you know, he's not interested in the final goal, but, but in the, uh, in the movement. So there was, Debate, you know, on that, and actually, you know, most of the, the leaders of the uh, Second International and the German you know, Social Democratic Party participated. Um, uh, Bernstein's uh, views were formally rejected, although, as you point out, um, there were the um, the degree of support that uh, Bernstein's uh, views had were much greater than. Um, than the people who had, who voted for him because they they figured it was you know, no reason to uh, you just you don't have to you, you you don't say these things you just do them that was right right yeah right um, so that's what they um, so so you began to have it and, and actually they're related to um, to Bernstein and really at actually the same time eighteen ninety nine in France. Uh, you had a, a French socialist um, named Millerand who actually joined a the became a minister in the French government in 1899. Um, this uh, this was the same the um, uh, that's something that it, that it really hadn't hadn't happened. That socialists had that hadn't fought. Um, they had proposed that nobody had you know supported that, and there was, that that caused a whole other debate in the international, which is um, one of the points that the new book will will take up. Um, but it, it's sort of a, a thing that sort of indicate the contradiction of, of Milleran's position is okay. He was um, you know he, he became a minister, but the defense minister in this government that he tanked on was was the, the general who had largely been responsible for the massacre of the, uh, uh, the veterans of the Paris Commune in 1871. So he, he was a fellow minister in, in, mm. 
in uh, Milleran's government. So there, there was a whole you know debate, and um, really it took up the the Second International Congresses of 1900 and 1904 were largely devoted to debating debating this question. And at the end, um, uh, it was decided that. Uh, you know, Miller, that uh, this uh, condemned the, uh, what Miller on did. And at the same time, it also adopted a position that uh, socialists had no business supporting um, bourgeois political parties either. So that, mm-hmm. that was uh, a, a related, uh, related aspect of the debate. Mm-hmm. And, and the reason why Miller on felt that he was justified in, in participating in bourgeois governments uh, and and bourgeois parties was be, was because he essentially held the same position as Bernstein, uh, which was that capitalism itself could overcome its contradictions and be transformed into socialism. Um, or was he just an opportunist through and through? Well, I I I think that's that's the latter is is the case because I. I I don't think he spent much time trying to justify it. And as a matter of fact, he very quickly left the had no uh, the the work, working class socialist movement. It just became a, a, a run of the mill capitalist politician who um, was in, in government for many years afterwards. Uh, he totally broke with the with socialism entirely. Uh, unlike unlike Bernstein, which who had uh, maintained. To, he became a, you know, just a uh, what we would consider a run-of-the-mill social democrat till the end of his life, um, you know, who, you know, you know, who called himself a socialist um, and would, would justify his position. Let's let's talk about that term, social democrat, for a moment, because, um, you know, what the the people who call themselves social democrats today uh, are are not quite the same as the people who call themselves. Social Democrats in the Second International. I don't. I don't believe. Um, uh, there's a, an old comedy routine uh, about social democracy by. Oh gosh, now the the name of the man. He just died. Uh, ah, I can't remember his name. All of a sudden, I'm getting old too now. But um, in any case, uh, where you know you, if you're a social democrat, you're kind of middle of the road. Uh, uh, you know, sort of neither on the left nor the right, according to this old comedy routine from the sixties, but what, what did the second international mean by, by the term social dem- democracy or social Democrat? Why, and why was that the banner under which uh, they organized? Well, well, I think that uh, here it's worthwhile to go back to what uh, we were discussing earlier. Um, that in throughout the 19th century, uh, the frame of reference uh, for politics, with you know, in the whole era of the bourgeois revolutions, uh, was it that the uh, most European uh, powers? You had a number of uh, dynasties, uh, dynasties, monarchies. Um, I, I, very few. Uh, uh, I think France became a republic in 1848, but then it, it, I think they still call themselves a republic. But, he, but even under the, uh, but it, even under the the empire the, of Napoleon the um, Third, and there were you know a couple of you know other, but very there were very few there were really very few, you know democratic rights were were um, uh, not in, in most countries were not not very developed. Um, so what and so the the question of democracy became a frame of reference, and you had um, you know what we were talking about before the the sort of the bourgeois democracy, what was called liberal democracy. You know those those uh, um, those who who viewed a uh, whose goal was a a system where the the propertyed classes would run things instead of some uh, semi-feudal nobility or, or monarchs. Uh, mm-hmm. um, so in counterposition to these liberal or bourgeois Democrats, the socialists called themselves social Democrats. Um, that is, they wanted to extend democracy to the social level. Um, so uh, this was the, you know, the term that, uh, that, um, 
that came to be used by, um, you know, by the by the Marxist movement, the revolutionary socialist movement. Although it's to be fair, it's worth pointing out that Marx and Engels were um, uh, were never they could go along with this term, but that they really didn't like it all that much. I think the uh, the term that Engels once used it that the that term I think it passed muster. I think that was the term he used. He says that certain social democrats could pass muster, but of course that they they actually preferred the term communist, which is you know what mm. the name of the communist manifesto. Um, but you know it was but um, social democrat that was the the uh, the term used, and it wasn't until nineteen when the, the term itself uh, became totally discredited by the majority of the, uh, you know, of the, the second international, the majority leadership, uh, that those, those, the le- left wing socialists uh, uh, gave up, abandoned the term because they, they, the term had been so, so totally um, disgraced that it had no authority amongst uh, it was felt that it had a little authority amongst uh, um, the, the conscious workers, you know, at other mm-hmm. time. Right. Um, I, I remember the name of the comedian, by the way. It was Mort Saul. You ever heard of Mort Saul? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So he, he used to do a routine on, on social Democrats. Um, so why did the Marx and Engels prefer the term communist to social democrat or social democracy just be, because it uh i mean they, they were certainly pro democracy uh right but they what what did communism communicate that social democracy didn't well well it's it's not uh, not that they thought that this the term the term was wrong or yet yeah, i mean they they supported the the uh you know the fight for democratic rights mm. uh, and that that's and actually if you you read the resolutions of the second international that, that that's um, that that was a an essential part of what they fought for was uh, what so what socialists they supported the fight for the extension of democratic they, they the fight for all with democratic rights whether it's um, um, you know the in, in terms of on the electoral political level on um, the, the type of political system and extending it to um, to the social level, you know, and, you know fighting for reforms, and, you know, the uh, uh, social social programs. Um, but but again, these weren't fought for as ends in themselves, but simply as as uh, weapons to to advance to advance the struggle even further. You know, you, you I mean, the, the things that the working class needed and and would. And by winning these these gains, the working class w- would um, get experience fighting and get confidence and uh, in its power and it, its ability to organize, um, and change things, and win allies from other other sections of the population, um, and put themselves in a position to advance further towards the the full taking of of. Uh, Political power by the working class, by the majority, um, and as a matter of fact, that was when in the early Ru- Russian Revolution in 1917, that was how it was uh, put forward by uh, how it was presented by supporters of the by supporters of, of the October Revolution and the Bolsheviks. Was this was the uh, the majority of the population uh, uh, asserting its its power. Um, that this was the, the most democratic um, type of system that could be um, uh, that could be fought for. Um, I want to read. We're we're coming up on the end of the first hour here, uh, but I want to read a section um, from the Second International's initial Congress, the founding Congress in 1889, um, because I think what I've been doing this in this first half is just trying to get a better understanding of how the second international conceived of its own political mission, you know, to to the the degree to which that conception was fragmented or, or divergent within the second international. Um, 
So here's a quote I want to ask you a question about. This is that the it, they said the emancipation of labor and humanity cannot occur without the international action of the proletariat, organized in class-based parties, which seizes political power through the expropriation of the capitalist class and the social appropriation of the means of production. And I guess what I want to ask you is, how did the members of the Second International understand the aim of social appropriation of the means of production? Um, I mean, it's easy enough to understand um, seizing political power and maybe that, but through that seizing property rights for the means of production. But this term social appropriation might seem to point a little bit beyond that. So I'm wondering if, if you thought that or think that it did. Um, well, I, I think that, you know, what you just quoted, uh, you know, as uh, one of the uh, important points that, uh, the, that was presented in the platform was a uh, was something that that really present, you know, it was that was from a resolution that had been presented by uh, two of the, you know, the. Uh, the leading Marxists within the Second International, August Babel in Germany and Jules Ged in France, um, and um, you know it's it's uh, it's something that's completely consistent with the um, you know the what had been outlined by Marx and Engels and their uh, you know in their in their writings and and what they had presented, and the, the social appropriation, the means of production, they. Uh, you know that this is a basic idea that that the Marxist movement has you know has really had since the beginning that that the uh, uh, they whether whether it's the the uh, manufacturing the factories the mills the transportation network you know all the the various aspect of it that the, the point of it is t- to use it for the benefit of society as a whole and not private property for a, uh, a handful of, of, uh, of capitalists. Um, so, you know, that's one of the things that's, uh, that, that, that sort of marked the, you know, the movement from the beginning. Now, how different people understood it, this is a separate question, because um, that I, I really can't speak to, because obviously there were, we know that there were, there were different currents that, to, you know, developed within, you know, within the movement at the time. But, you know, I, I think as, as a, um, as a good, uh, short, uh, presentation of what the founding platform of it is, it, this is one of the things that I think really helps, um, uh, establish l- at least on the, on the, on the, on the level of its adopt formally adopted resolutions the revolutionary Marxist character of the, you know, of the Second International in the, the quarter of a century before the uh, First World War, but the, but again, as we were we were talking about the, um, you know, it's the you know at the same time as that you had these uh, formally adopted resolutions, you had the development of different trends. Um, you know, within the International, which is really what the subject of the, the debates. Uh, really help to illustrate in a big way. Um, I I wonder to what degree people within the Second International had read Capital, uh, you know the at least the first volume of Capital. Where was was that a did that inform their perspective on uh, on what it means to overcome the capitalist means of production? You think? Well, uh, certainly. I mean, I certainly the majority of people who supported wouldn't have read it. Um, but but I think it, it was um, that was a work that was um, uh, certainly socialist leaders. It, actually, one one thing here it's worth pointing out. Um, you know, the, the uh, you know this. It's always viewed as sort of uh, today. Uh, it's sort of viewed as something that. Um, you know, but it's very sort of difficult to understand, and you know, uh, but when Marx wrote the the first, certainly the first volume of Capital, and uh, it was published in eighteen sixty seven, I believe, mm-hmm. uh, he viewed this as a as something that workers could and should read. 
mm-hmm. uh, that um, and he, he thought it was written uh, to an extent. It was actually even written, you know, written for uh, to, at least to a, but on one level for uh, for you know for working people. Um, so so I, I think that that did um, um, certainly informed a lot, you know a lot of the leaders, and I think you know certainly a lot of the leaders were. Uh, and 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 the ranks were familiar with it. It was promoted at, at, at different levels, but in, in some, you know, uh, certainly in, in different parties and in different ways. But uh, but I think it did. It was one of the the, the the foundation stones of you know of the movement. Um, I just wonder to what extent the Second International so, thought that. Um nationalization or the ownership of the means of production by the state was synonymous with socialism. Um, and, and that's the reason why I brought up capital. Cause if you, if you read capital, you can see that there's that it, it's not as simple as taking up uh, the wealth and distributing it equitably. Right. Um, because of the way that the production itself informs the, the kind of distribution you're going to be able to achieve. Um, that's so I, I just wondered to what extent did, did the second international see its task as not just like empowering the working class, but overcoming class or, or abolishing you know, self the self abolition of the, of the working class. Um, well, you know, what, what actually, what an interesting thing it, they weren't, um, I'm not, uh, I haven't come across any big, Debates on you know on the question of like socialization you know and in comparison to nationalization and so forth in the in the prior to First World War, but as a sort of an interesting um, in the years right after the First World War, it actually the question of socialization actually became a um, you know and socialization slash nationalization. Uh, became a real discussion and it was really put forward by a number of sort of um, uh, actually sort of see um, within the, the second international it, it, uh, there were sort of three trends that developed the left, we had, we're talking about that we were we've been talking about the, the left wing and the right you know and the right wing but there was also a sort of a center wing that developed mm-hmm. in the years before um, you know, the First World War uh, that became associated, you know, associated with people like uh, Kautsky uh, and others. And then, for example, the Austrian uh, party, Hilferding and mm-hmm. so forth. And especially the, these uh, these centrists, uh, for, they, they began to really uh, present the perspective of socialization um, and, and counterposing this to... Um, Really, what the Bolsheviks did, um, and so they came up with actually a number of schemes of socialization schemes. And what it really came down to was uh, workers and management sharing responsibility, co-responsibility. Um, uh, in other words, sort of collaboration between the uh, the workers and the bosses. And so you had a lot of these schemes where. Um, you had the, you know, the, the trade unions were one thing, the management is another, and then the third part, which supposedly the uh, the neutral arbiter was the uh, the government, and of course, what we generally know is the governments always take, uh, since the governments are basically are controlled by the capitalist class, they that's who they, um, that's whose interests they represent. Um, so it was one of these things that, again, highlighted the, the question that we were discussing earlier of reform versus revolution as uh, counterposed strategic uh, objectives within the Second International as they as it developed. Yeah, OK. Um, well, I, I, we've reached the end of the first half for sure. So um, in the second half, I want to kind of go through maybe a bit more of the, uh, the specifics uh, of the Second International's different uh, congresses and the questions that were brought up, and also uh, talk a little bit about uh, the the what I mentioned at the at the outset, the uh, questions of 
uh, socialist participation in government, colonialism, immigration, women's suffrage, and militarism and war. If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both. <laughs>